This is Pawn Zero to Hero. It's the fifth episode of the series and today we are going to take a look at Pawn Tools. This Python module gives us all the powers we need to efficiently interact with a binary. Time to dig into it. In the last episode, we looked at GDB and how it allows us to dynamically step through a binary and reverse it that way. With GDB, we could stop it at interesting sections, look at the internal structure, but binary exploitation needs one more thing, and that is a way to interact with the binary. Every security mistake always comes from user input and freely being able to input exactly what we want into a binary is necessary. But if you've ever tried to input some complex bytes into a binary, then you know the struggle. It just doesn't work. Let's have Pontools solve that for us. We're building onto the knowledge that we have acquired throughout the rest of this series, so be sure to check out the full playlist to get up to speed. Links can be found in the description as always. If this video gets a thousand views, then I will for sure continue this series, so share it if you're finding these videos useful. But with all that out of the way, let's take a look at why, when, and how we might want to use pawn tools. In this video, we're going to show off the power of pawn tools by using it. And for today's video, I have created a binary. Now this challenge binary has the SUID bit set, meaning that it will execute as root in this case. We can of course reverse this binary, but in order to make showcasing pawn tools a bit faster, we'll also have a look at the source code. Here we can see that it starts with a set UID to zero, meaning that we will indeed execute everything as root. Now there is a bunch of logic in this file, but we can skip past that for now and look at the last line, which will execute slash bin slash sh. And that is the goal of this challenge, get an sh shell as root. So it should be as simple as just running the binary and getting to the end, right? Well, let's execute it. The binary tells us that we need to answer all of its questions and that it will then guarantee us some rewards. It gives us a, a first command, which is to repeat after the binary and say, I obey your orders. If I input some question marks, for example, we see that the binary exits. Okay, we run it again and this time I type in, I obey your orders. And that seems to work. We've progressed to level two and that is great. Now we're asked to solve an equation and this is very easy, so let's solve it. And with that out of the way, we already get asked the third question, which is to input OX dead beef. But after inputting that string, the program exits. What was wrong here? Maybe we just need to enter dead beef without the OX or maybe something else is going on. We could now rerun the entire program and enter all of that information again, just to give it another go, but you can already tell that that is a lot of manual labor. We want a way of quickly getting back to this point. And that is the first reason why you should use pawn tools, automating complex exploit steps. In this case, they aren't all too complex, but you can imagine that sometimes there is a lengthy setup process before your actual exploitation can occur. Let's get going and let's start very simple with installing pawn tools, which is very simple. All we need to do is run pip3 install pawn tools. And that's it. That is all we have now installed pawn tools. Now let's create a new file. I like to call it solve.py and let's get scripting here. I like to start my file with a shebang line just telling bash to execute this using Python 3. Following that, I import everything from pawn, which is the module that we just installed. Now I have to get access to my binary. In this case, the binary can be found locally. So I'm going to create a variable IO, which is going to start the process dot slash challenge. That is just telling pawn tools to start that process. Now in CTFs and in real life, you will often have to exploit a binary running remotely on a server. And in that case, you won't use process here, but you'll use remote with the host name or IP and the port to attach to. And that's the second reason why you should use pawn tools. It does all the networking for you. 
If you write code that can interact with a local binary, then it can also interact with a remotely running binary. All the calls are the same and all the networking is handled for you without having to worry about it. But right now we're attacking a local binary, so this is fine. In PonTools, we can receive data and send data. This is the basis of PonTools. So let's take a look at our binary and let's receive one line of data and print it out. We do that using our variable IO and then calling the receive line function on it. Let's print that data out. We see that it contains hello hacker as expected. Now, okay, if we want to automate the first steps of the binary, then we need to send I obey your orders at some point. I'll manually run the binary here so we can count how many lines we have to receive before we can actually send. I count one, two, three, four, five, six lines. So in my script, I'll write six receive line statements. And now we're ready to send our text. To do that, I'll call io.sendline. And as an argument, we pass in some bytes. Now in Python, we can do that by just creating a string, but prefacing that with the B character. This will send the string, I obey your orders as bytes. Let's run it. Wait, the binary just exits? Why is that? Well, our pawn tool script ended, so Python stopped our process. Luckily, there is a solution for that, and that is to add a call to io.interactive. I always have this function call at the end of my scripts, since it gives you a way to interact with the binary as you would in a normal terminal. And we can see exactly that by running it and seeing that we now get the message that our previous answer was correct and we get the second question. Now, this should be easy, right? We just have to send the correct number after we get the question. This time, I'm going to use a receive until statement and receive everything until we get a question mark. Then we can just send the correct number. But when running that, we see that it doesn't work. The process stopped with exit code one. How do we debug that? Well, I'm going to add a line to the top of my script. This is setting the context.log underscore level to debug. This way we get more debugging information and let's rerun the script. This time we see exactly which bytes we received and which we sent. We see that at the end, we sent our number and before that, that we got the equation, but this time the equation is different and thus the answer should also be different. Okay, so our script will have to take that into account. Let's start off by capturing the data we receive in a variable. I'm then going to use some Python magic here to split the text we receive on spaces and then take the last three parts of that, which is the first number, a plus sign and the second number. Now, I only want the first and the third of those, so I'm also going to set the step here to two. So we only get those two numbers, and now I can convert the first number to an integer and the second one as well. But note that in the second one, I had to remove the last character uh, as that is a question mark. And that's just regular Python code. Uh, it, I always write unreadable Python code like this because that's just how my brain works but feel free to get the numbers in any way you wish. This is just a string where we have to extract the numbers. That's just basic Python and Python scripting is a prerequisite for this course. So feel free to get the numbers whichever way you want. With those numbers, we can now send our line using io.sendline. I use a format string here to turn them into a string. Uh, and now that string obviously also needs to be converted to bytes. So for that, I use the encode function so that we send across bytes. Let's test our code. Nice, that worked. We are now back at our dead beef question. And if I try something, I can immediately, instantly try something else using our cool script. But sadly, nothing I seem to input here works. Let's take a look at the source code to see what this binary really expects. I see that it expects a backslash x de backslash x ad backslash x be backslash x ef. Thus, it expects four bytes that don't have a character that represents them. Now, as far as I'm aware, there's not really a way of inputting this manually. And this is the third reason why you want to use pawn tools. It allows you to send anything you want to a binary. From null bytes to just text, pawn tools can do it for you. So let's try this out. I'm going to send my data after the server has sent ox dead beef exclamation point. I'll use io.send line after for that. And as the second argument here, I'll use p64, which stands for 
pack for 64 bits and will take in an integer and pack it into a keyword. You can also use P32 for 32-bit binaries. The reverse of packing is unpacking, for which the commands are U64 and U32. Unpacking is something that we won't go into in this video, but which we will see a bunch more in the future. But okay, we want to pack a value, in this case the value OX dead beef, uh, represented as hexadecimals, but we could obviously also represent that as an integer. With that ready, let's run the binary once again. Hmm, it exits again. Let's debug it. But instead of writing that annoying context.log underscore level equals debug line, I'll just run the script with debug as an extra argument. By debugging it, we see that we've sent something, but in the bytes view here, it doesn't actually look like OXZBeef. What's going on here? Well, this binary is LSB, standing for the least significant bit. This endianess basically means that we need to reverse the data we're sending here. This may seem very counterintuitive at first, but it starts to make a lot of sense once you run into it and debug it yourself. Before we go into debugging though, let's quickly reverse the data on byte level in our script. So OX dead beef becomes OX EF BE AD DE. And with that change, we can run the script and this time it tells us that we've succeeded and it gives us a shell. Who are we? Well, we are root. That is the solution and some very basic usage of pawn tools. But I talked about debugging. In the last video, we debugged using GDB. So let's do that now as well. This is all a bit more advanced. So it's totally fine if you don't understand what's going on here. I'm going to add a context.terminal, which is going to run a tmux command. Now tmux is a great way of multiplexing your terminals. So this will just split the current terminal in two. Now in one of those panes, I will start GDB. GDB will be started using gdb.attached with our IO as the first argument and a string as a second one. And the second parameter is used to specify the commands for GDB to execute when it attaches. Uh, this case, in this case, I'll just start off with C for continuing right as we launch. So we're executing the binary. Let's try it out. For that, I need to be in a tmux terminal. So I'll first start tmux and now I can run the script and we see that it opens up a new pane with GDB. Now note that this won't work on the binary with the SUID bit set, because then we can't p trace the binary. Uh, but since we have read permissions on it, we can just make a copy without having the SUID bit set and run that process just for debugging purposes. But we still obviously run into the same problem. The binary immediately exits. This is because we first need to set a breakpoint. I'm going to edit our script and add an input right before we send our dead beef payload. This way, Python is going to wait for some input from us before sending that. Now I'll rerun our script and see that it waits for our input, but instead of giving it some input, I will go over to the GDB pane and use a control C here, which will just kill the binary currently running, but it will also show us some information such as where it was currently, what it was currently executing. And for example, here in the stack trace, we see that we're currently in the read function, which we obviously expect since the binary was about to read our input. But we can also see that that read function is being called from the main function, main plus 531 to be specific. Now let's disassemble the main function and we find our call to read. Now let's find some interesting spot to set a breakpoint at. And in this case, I find the string compare at main plus 556 Pretty interesting, so I'll use that. In my script, I will add that to the GDB commands to be ran after the attach. So I will write BP main plus 556. Now we can rerun the binary once again, go past our wait statement and see that our breakpoint triggered. Great. Now we see that the string compare is comparing OX dead beef with some junk followed by a zero zero, so a null byte and OX dead beef, but in reverse. Okay, weird stuff going on here. Which is our string? Is it S1? Is it S2? Well, the easiest way to check would be to just change the bytes on our end, change the bytes that we're sending and try it again. So uh, I'm setting it up here so that we're sending OX lead beef. And uh, when we rerun, we see that we control S1 and that we need our value to equal S2. Now, as we've learned from previous videos, functions such as string compare take their variables from registers. 
The first one is RDI, the second is RSI. And in this case, if we look into RSI, we see that same weird value again. But let's dig deeper. Let's get a hex dump of RSI by running hex dump dollar sign RSI. And now we see the dead beef bytes correctly. And we also see that no bytes and we see that junk from earlier, but actually it's a string. And this string says, correct, here's your price and so on. Now strings are no terminated here. So that means that uh, this no byte here stops the string and all we really need to compare against is OX dead beef. But due to the NDNS least significant bit, we need to provide that in reverse. So back in the code, we can just turn that all around. Uh, I'm now also going to remove the breakpoint and the wait input statement. And then finally, if we rerun it, we will see that indeed we get our shell and we've solved the challenge. That was a lot to take in. And that was only the basics of pawn tools. But the most important part here is that you know when and why to use pawn tools. And there are three main reasons. The first is automating complex exploit steps. Very often a difficult setup is the reason why people don't adequately test stuff. Simplifying that setup by using pawn tools to automate certain steps is very, very important. Secondly, all the interaction logic is handled for you. No dealing with sockets, rewriting scripts for the remote, it's all done for you. So you can focus on the specific exploiting of the binary. Three, you can send anything you want to the binary. Pawn tools allows you to not be confined within what's possible to be typed on your keyboard or characters that are understood by the terminal. Any bytes in any formation will work in pawn tools. And those are the main takeaways here. If you want to learn more about Pwn Tools, then be sure to check out the documentation as it is truly amazing. In the future, we will be doing much more crazy stuff with Pwn Tools, and this includes things such as cyclic strings for finding offsets, shellcraft for crafting assembly exploit code specific for your exploitation purposes, the ROP module for crafting return-oriented programming exploit chains as easy as possible, format string for, well, exploiting format string vulnerabilities, and much, much more. This tool will be at the basis of all the exploits we will be writing in the future, so be sure to set it up and play around with this. Now, before I end this video, I have a task for you, some homework, if you will. In the description, you will find a link to a GitHub containing some challenges for you. In the next video, we will then go over the solutions for all of these, uh, and this will finish off the reversing part of this series. From there on out, it's all going to be about buffer overflows, format strings, ROP chains, and all that other binary exploitation mumble. So be sure to give those challenges a go. Use the tools that we talked about in this series, go back to the videos if you need a hand, and I'd love to see some comments from you if you solved the challenge or if you got stuck, feel free to ask me for some hints. Uh, and all of these challenges will be from previous CTFs, so you can also look for write-ups, of course. But with that being said, we've reached the end of the fifth episode of this series. Click the like button if you liked the video and be sure to comment any questions, concerns, or just nice things down below. That's it for me. I hope you enjoyed the video and I hope to see you back for the next one. Take care.